We are starting a new series today, and it's going to last through the month of September. And once again, I picked these, this series about, you know, four months ago, thinking this would be great. And now I'm here and thinking, what was I thinking? Um, because we are going to tackle the prophet Amos. I don't know if you've really read Amos before. I don't know that I've ever really preached a full series on Amos in almost 30 years. But we are going to look at this prophet throughout the month. So here's my challenge to you. Read it. Uh, it's, it's not very long. And you can actually read it in one sitting if you want, but read it chapter at a time, read it week at a time, read it over and over again. And just remember that it wasn't written yesterday. Remember that, because sometimes we go to the Bible and we expect to read it like we're reading a John Grisham novel or something. Uh, no, this is an ancient, ancient text. And uh, we, we are so grateful to have it in our hands. But just remember that we're a little bit removed from the original writing. So if you struggle with it, that's okay. But most of all, ask God's Spirit to help you, teach you during the time of reading. So that's my challenge. Read Amos over the month of September. Well, the big focus for Amos is justice. And the reason that I hesitate to jump into this is because justice is such a loaded word right now. It's become almost politicized. And so uh, I, I enter with a little bit of, um, not dread, but caution as we begin to talk about justice. So where do we begin to talk about justice from the book of Amos? Willie Nelson. You didn't see that coming, did you? <laughs> We're yeah, the prophet Willie Nelson. We're going to start with Willie. Willie Nelson uh, did a song, I think it was back in 2003, with a guy by the name of Toby Keith. Some of you might recognize that if you listen to country music. You don't have to admit it here that you do. Um, but Willie and Toby did this song called Beer for My Horses. And the song, the, uh, the uh, chorus goes like this. Justice is the one thing you should always find. Now, they probably should have stopped the song right there. It would have been great. But it does go on. Justice is the one thing you should always find. You got to saddle up your boys, got to draw a hard line. When the gun smoke settles, we'll sing a victory tune and we'll all meet back at the local saloon. That's where the beer for the horses comes in, right? Okay, some of you are singing it in your head. I can tell because you're kind of doing the beat. Anyway, uh, Willie Nelson and Toby Keith sing this song and it really captures a particular part of justice that we often focus on, especially when we see movies or, you know, cops and bad guys or those kind of things. It's a kind of retributive justice. This response to criminal behavior that focuses on the punishment of the lawbreakers, right? That's a kind of justice, that kind of punitive type of justice. There are wrongs in the world, and the people that commit those wrongs need to be punished. Maybe not the way that Toby Keith suggests. You can listen to the song at home on your own time. But there is that aspect of justice. It's kind of punitive, retributive. It's a response to criminal behavior and it focuses on due punishment. But the problem with that is, if we stop there, sometimes that retributive justice can begin to look and smell and feel a lot like revenge, right? And so that's the danger, that's the difficulty. So there are other facets to justice. I think one that we've been talking about uh, for quite a bit, this last few years especially, is something we call social justice. Social justice may be defined this way. It's justice in terms of the distribution of wealth, opportunities, privileges within a society. It uses words like equity and access, participation and rights. If, uh, if uh, punishment is uh, restributive justice, then social justice might be distributive justice as we think about it that way, the distribution. But a lot of people are hesitant to take those words up, even though they've been around for a long time, because as we focus on them, some people are afraid that we'll just lean into something called socialism. And so we hesitate to use those words. So how do we do this? Because we could spend all day with modifiers to justice. <laughs> we could talk about restorative justice, economic justice, reparative justice. There's all kinds of modifiers to justice. So where do we get the concept of justice that we can actually talk about here on Sunday morning? Well, that's where we want to look at biblical justice. 
What does the Bible say about justice? Where do we find ourselves as followers of Jesus and as those that say that we follow after the word of God? What does the Bible say, if anything, about justice? The good news is this. The Bible says a lot about justice, (laughs) an awful lot about justice, and it includes retributive justice. It also includes restorative justice. And so we find a lot of concepts of justice in the Bible. And one of the great places to work through justice is in the prophets. And the prophet Amos helps us to think through uh, the concept of justice. Well, to get us on the path, today I just want to do something simple. I want to say two things about Amos to give us kind of a context. And then I want to say one thing about justice, just to get us started in the conversation. So the first thing about Amos is this. Are you ready for it? I'm going to take a drink just for dramatic effect. Amos was a shepherd. You're like, I knew that. I listened to the reading. It says it in the opening line. Amos was a shepherd. Why is that astounding or important? Well, Amos takes us back uh, a little more than 750 years before Jesus. That's the context. And he makes a point in opening his prophecy to say that he is one of the shepherds of Tekoa. He's one of the shepherds. And what he's saying in that is this. He wasn't a credentialed prophet. He didn't have his credentials on the wall. He didn't have, you know, a doctor of ministry from Fuller Seminary or something. He wasn't a credentialed prophet. He didn't go to Samuel's prophetic school. I'm not talking about this Samuel, although he could have a school. But there was a a school of the prophets in the Old Testament. Do you know that? And Samuel kind of got that going and other other people led the school of the prophets. He wasn't part of that school. There were no prophets in his family that we know of. He was not a prophet or the son of a prophet. And there was no connections with like Isaiah had. Isaiah had great connections with royalty. He kind of had an in. Or, or Elisha had a mentor in Elijah, right? And Amos doesn't have that. Or uh, Ezekiel was a priest in training before he became a prophet. Amos didn't have that. He, he's got no claim to fame. He's got no right to claim to be a prophet. In a, in a sense, he is a blue-collar prophet. <laughs> this, this is why I like Amos. He's our redneck prophet. He probably would have listened to Toby Keith or something like that. It's interesting, though, when he starts off his prophecy, the word that he uses for shepherd isn't the normal word that you'd find in Hebrew for shepherd. It's actually a word that's descriptive. It just means, I was a gatherer of sheep. Because he doesn't want to identify or associate with the shepherds of Israel, because that phrase is a loaded phrase. So he's saying, I'm I'm not a leader. (laughs) I'm not qualified. I'm not part of the prophetic tradition. But I have one qualification, one credential. What was that? I have a word from God. I have a word from God. I think that's wonderful. I don't know how many times that you and I have faced situations where we think, I am not up for this task, but God. (laughs) But God has called me to be a parent, to be a father. But God has called me to stand on this pulpit. I am not up for this task, but God. And that's what Amos comes from. God had called him, even though he didn't have the credentials. Okay, the second thing about Amos isn't actually about him as a person, but about the whole book and the context, and it's this, the divided kingdom. This is really, really important. So shortly after King Solomon passed, the kingdom was divided between the north, which is Israel, and the south, which is called Judah. And this is really important for the context of Amos. And Amos gives us a a direct context. He says that Uzziah was the king of Judah. Does anybody remember where we've heard of Uzziah in other places in the prophets? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. That's Isaiah the prophet. So we know now that Amos was a contemporary around the time of Isaiah. And then in the north was Jeroboam. And this is actually Jeroboam II. And he is the king of Israel. Well, why is this important? Well, both those kings had fairly successful reigns as far as kings go in Judah and Israel. Uzziah was fairly successful in a moral sense, for right up until the end of his uh, his rule. But Jeroboam, and this is what's really important, Jeroboam brought tremendous success and prosperity 
to Israel. Jeroboam had material success. In fact, it was one of the most prosperous times in all of Israel. The northern kingdom was characterized by affluence, security, prosperity, power, influence. This isn't the Israel we sometimes hear that's being taken into captivity and lying in ruins. No, this is Israel at its peak in the northern kingdom. Prosperity, security, power, influence. But it also came with a dark side. And the dark side is that Israel was also known for the oppression and exploitation of the poor. It was known for luxury in palaces of unheard of splendor. And it was known for constantly craving amusement. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to draw the parallels between (laughs) what was happening in Israel and what's happening in the society in which we live, I think. We live in a very prosperous, affluent society. We also live in a society that also exploits the poor. And we need to recognize that. We need to recognize where we're at. So that's why I want to explore this book of Amos, because I think it has a message that we absolutely need to hear. So here's the thing. Amos is actually from the south. He's from Judah. So not only is he the redneck prophet that has no credentials, but he's going into the north and they don't want him there. So imagine having that task. And so he's kind of a foreigner in the north as well as he goes. And he has a message to declare from God. What's the message? Well, it was read for us. And I'm going to read it again in the message translation just to get maybe a different angle. Here's the message that Amos delivers to the northern kingdom. God says, I can't stand your religious meetings. I'm fed up with your conferences and conventions. I want nothing to do with your religious projects, your pretentious slogans and goals. I'm sick of your fundraising schemes, your public relations and image making. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. When was the last time you sang to me? Do you know what I want? I want justice, oceans of it. I want fairness, rivers of it. That's what I want. That's all I want. That's the message that Amos had for the Northern Kingdom. And I think that's the message that Amos has for you and I today. Well, number three, one thing that I just want to say about justice to get us started on this road and this conversation. Because there are some philosophies out there that when we come to define justice or understand justice, uh, we're encouraged to look around What is the moral consensus around us? And that moral consensus then becomes the standard for justice. There are real problems with that. And if you think through that just for a half of a second, you might realize that there are problems with that standard for justice. Others say, well, look within. Look in yourself. Whatever you feel is kind and loving and true, then do that for others. And that becomes the standard for justice. Again, I think we could get really off track with that. So what does the Bible say? Well, the Bible says, don't look around and don't look in. Instead, look up. Because the heart of justice is found in the character of God. That's my one point that I want us to take away uh, today. The heart of justice is found in the character of God. And true justice begins with the character of God and then flows from an authentic living relationship with him. God, by his character, sets the standard for justice. And we find that in all kinds of beautiful ways all throughout Scripture, and we're going to explore that together. And we enter into true justice when we have an authentic relationship with him. So biblical justice isn't first, let's rush out and set the world right. Uh, There is work to be done. But before we set out to set the world right or have a coffee where we're going to fix all the problems of the world, some of us did that this week, right? Uh, Let's focus instead on getting this relationship right. Let's return to God. And biblical justice is not simply about um, retribution or punishment. There is an aspect to that. But biblical justice is first and foremost about repentance and returning to God. Why is that? Because the enemies of biblical justice are two. 
Number one, forgetfulness. And number two, hypocrisy. See, Amos goes to the northern kingdom and he says, not only have you forgotten how to treat one another fairly, you've actually forgotten your relationship with God. And so all throughout Amos, this is what we find. God says, look, I brought you out of slavery, but now you're selling people into bondage. Have you forgotten? Or God says, I protected your children. And, and now, and this is literally a verse in Amos, you're ripping them out of pregnant mothers. Have you forgotten? I led you to a land with milk and honey, but now you won't share with the needy. You've closed your fist. Have you forgotten? Forgetting the mercies and the grace of God leads to injustice. And that's part of the message of Amos. So Amos calls the people to true worship so that justice may flow like rivers, righteousness righteousness like a never-ending stream. That word righteousness in Hebrew, tzedakah, it means a standard of right, equitable relationships between people, no matter their social differences. That's the righteousness that God is calling us to. A standard of right, equitable relationships between people, no matter their social differences. And justice in Hebrew, mishpat, It's concrete action that we take to correct injustice and to create righteousness. But it all starts with repentance and returning to God. And that's the point I want to make today. Well, we started with Toby Keith and Willie Nelson. We'll end with a better quote (laughs) from Martin Luther King Jr. August 28, 1963, famous speech. I'm sure you've heard parts of it and know what I'm referring to. But in that speech, he says this. No, no, we are not satisfied and will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. He was quoting Amos, wasn't he? He was quoting this very text that we've read. And he reminds us that we should not be satisfied with empty religious rituals that are disconnected from the way that we treat people. We need to return to justice. We need to return to God so that justice might roll down. Let's pray together. Father, forgive us for the times that we've just come and paid lip service to you. When we've come with empty and vain traditions and just kept up appearances and then gone out and lived our lives with no concern for the vulnerable, the poor, for those who are different from us, Father, help us to sense your heart. Help us to repent and return so that we might see your justice in this land. Father, help us to act justly, to love mercy, but help us today to walk humbly with you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.